Ah, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, Good. how are you? Good. Um, what I want to do is I want to go over some questions. Um, questions that would be really helpful for analyzing the text and interactive because I don't want to be the one doing all the talking. I want to give you tools to analyze a text. But before we get started, I like what is your first impression after reading um, How to Tame a Wild Tongue? I personally had to read it twice because at first it was a little confusing with, and there's like a lot of Spanish in it. But then once I like started to like actually understand what she was saying, I thought it was super interesting and all of her points about like the different types of like Spanish and English combinations and about what really stood out to me is how she said like half the things that happened to her would never happen to a, if she was a guy and stuff like that. And I feel like that's a really important thing to pull out, especially during this day and age with all of the recent things going on and stuff. Yeah, that claim that um, language is a male discourse, that really blew my mind. It, um, yeah, yeah, I just had never thought of it like that. Um, Kiana, first impressions. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Um, I liked also how she talked about um, like the variation of language that they're used to and like how they might alter it like depending on who they're talking to or what kind of situation they're in. Um, I also really liked the part where she talked about um, how like there's like an internal struggle between like, um, like the border between the cultures she feels and sometimes like it gives her like a loss of identity almost. Yeah, that, that idea of identity um, and identity and language being woven together. And if you take away language, you're removing somebody's identity. Um, she calls it, um, she says it's violent. Um, she touches on that in a, in a couple of places. Um, sorry, he, um, first impressions. I really enjoyed the reading as well. And I think it made me think a lot, especially about like colonization's effects on like different countries. And specifically, it made me think about that because in the beginning, the very beginning of the book, I really enjoyed the quote where it was, I think it said, how can you say that taking away language is not more violent than war? And so that quote really stood out to me because I, it's just made me really think about the impact of how taking that away can, like you guys said, can take away that person's identity. Yeah, that, that quote is really moving to me. Um, I'm curious, Sari, there, um, did you understand, I, I know you speak Spanish fluently. Um, did all the Spanish make sense to you? Yeah, it did, because I feel like um, I have a lot of like, um, Latino friends and in my school um, I, a majority of the people who went there were Latino and they um, each one like either came from different like Latin countries or they just lived in kind of like different parts that had kind of like their own dialects like Chicano um, like speaking like Chicano and stuff like that so it was pretty easy to understand the text and like certain words that were highlighted made sense to me too that I was like oh I know that one like when they were talking about like vato, chale. And so that was like kind of interesting to see. Yeah, I, I do not speak Spanish. I know enough that most of the sentences made sense to me. And so when I was teaching on this class on the border where most of my sp students um, speak Spanish, they, um, they told me that it wasn't always, they go, yeah, we wouldn't say that um, on the border, you know, like on the Tijuana border. Um, so that Tex-Mex is a little different, the dialect of um, Spanish that is spoken there. Yeah, <laughs> it was like certain, I don't know, like I feel like that some of the text that we read that was like in Spanish, I'm like, I feel like I would hear that specifically like in Barrio Logan, because Barrio Logan is full of like Chicanos and Chicanas. And so I'm like, oh, I can see that being spoken there. But if I were to like go over Mexico, I'd be like, I don't know if I'd hear like my cousins talking like that. <laughs> 
Yeah, and and that's kind of you know, like where she weaves this in these border mm-hmm. dwellers and you know, like part of that identity thing. It's really um, see so you're catching parts of this text mm-hmm. that I might not have caught if I hadn't been teaching this in a class on the border. So, um, Sammy, first impressions. Um, I thought it was really deep and really eye-opening. And um, for me being like a a white female, I think it really touched in um, like white privilege. And I think that like, if I ever had to, like, if I was told, like, you are not allowed to speak your language that you are most comfortable with, I think that would be, um, I just think that'd be, like, such a huge struggle, and it's hard for me to, like, wrap my mind around it. Um, at the end of the text, she, at, like, this, at the story, she talks about how um, Chicanos are patient, and they hold on to like who they are and they'll never let go. And she kind of talks about how like, like in years to come, like the soil that I th- I don't, I can't find it. Oh, it says, um, but more than we count the blows, we count the days, the weeks, the years, the centuries, the eons until the white laws and commerce and custom full rot and the deserts they've created lie bleached. And so I think that like, it kind of like talks, like kind of touches on how maybe like out, like the American culture is temporary, but she said, is saying that like her culture is going to be there forever. Yes. And I, um, yeah, this was really profound to me. I mean, it is like, we will endure. Um, and that we right there reminds me if, if the fact that I struggled to understand all the Spanish and had to look up some things, because she doesn't translate everything. And yet she's assuming, I mean, like she's putting those words there for a reason. So she's assuming that they matter. And yet I don't understand them all. And so she's not, I am not her primary audience. Um, who is her primary audience? I would say like other like um, Chicanos like her who have the same feeling of, I don't know the word, like, I don't know, like being like taken out of their own culture or being like stripped from their language. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And so she's not talking to Mexicans and she isn't talking to um, necessarily she's talking to people who were raised on the border with this multi-language um, where, you know, like some of my students in Chula Vista, they will tell me that um, you know, like their Mexican relatives criticize their Spanish, but they get criticized for their English also in classrooms and in the larger community. And it's almost like their language is illegitimate. Um, and, and she goes to great lengths to show that the language that she speaks, the language that other border dwellers speak is legitimate. And um, how does she do that? Um, I feel like she might um, do that by like, explaining her struggles and how this really affects her as a person maybe trying to like relate to other people and um kind of convey like the fact that maybe other people who have the same um like first language feel the same way and that they shouldn't feel like not um they shouldn't feel like they're less than or anything just because they might be used to difference yeah, she definitely does it through the telling of personal experience. But then there's these sections um, that I, I, Riley, you mentioned, you know, like I, it took me a while to get through it. And it's, there's a lot there on these sections where she talks about, um, where she starts explaining how Chicano Spanish is a border tongue, 
that de developed naturally. And she has this analysis about, you know, like the different types of Spanish and she names them um, or the languages she, she speaks, standard English, working class slang English. And so she names all of those. And then she has this history of the origins of Chicano Spanish and, oh, and the, the rules and the different differences in vocabulary, but how maybe the Chicano Spanish is actually closer to the Castilian. And so she's got tons of details and examples that illustrate the legitimacy of this language she speaks. Why do you think that's so valuable to add that? I think it um, like makes her sound more credible and makes her audience like be more like persuaded. Yeah, and so definitely I think um, the larger community in America needs to understand this, but particularly if some people feel like their language has been stolen from them, they need that reassurance that who they are, their identity and their language is legitimate, um, which is a really, really powerful thing. Um, what, about the, what about the title, How to Tame a Wild Tongue? Um, titles matter a great deal. So why do you think she names it that? I feel like for me, how I kind of got it, like she obviously had the literal definition at the dentist, but I feel like it also just kind of showed how she had to like kind of to um, like people in the US, they would consider her as like her language being wild or like foreign kind of a thing, even though that's just for her. And it's kind of like the whole overall message about how people like almost thought they were like better than her since she was different or not from there and stuff. So to them, it seemed wild and not like how it's supposed to be. So she kind of had to like fake and pretend like she wasn't who she was just to be able to fit in with the rest of us. Uh, absolutely, Riley. In fact, at the uh, at the top of the second page, she asks, you know, like, how do you tame it? How do you bridle and saddle the tongue? How do you make it lie down? And then she has that quote about violence and war. You know, like, so she asks, how do you do this? And then she has the quote that taking somebody's language away is violent, like in war. And then she gives three distinct examples of the violence that was, uh, and the trauma that was perpetuated on her, you know, like speaking Spanish at recess, um, saying her name with a Spanish accent, her mother telling her to speak English a certain way. And then at Pan American University, where she has to take an extra class to get rid of her accent. It's like violence, violence, violence. And um, before we wrap up, uh, what did you learn about Gloria Anseldova? Did you look her up at all? So she's an essayist and a poet, and um, she's also a queer theorist. She passed away, I think, in, I want to say 1987, but I'm not absolutely positive. Um, this was published in a book that's filled with her poetry. Um, it's called Borderlands La Frontera. And um, colon, the new mestiza, which um, mestiza, forgive me if I have this incorrect, but it's a, it's a mix. Is that correct? Those of you who know more Spanish than I do? Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, um, but obviously it's a person. And, and so the claim and the title of the book that this comes from is that um, when you live on the border, there's a new mixture. Um, in fact, all of Mexico, there are tons of indigenous people in Mexico and the Spanish conquered them and stole their language. I mean, it's just like this perpetuation of trauma, trauma, trauma um, with stealing languages. And um, I'm gonna tell you, I think, I feel like this is the hardest text 
of the one of all the texts that we have. And yet it's the one that speaks to this concept of language and identity and it's filled with rhetorical strategies and evidence and stories about her identity. Be looking for where she tells her own story. Um, think about how she's establishing her identity in order to build ethos and, and strengthen her argument for that audience that um, it's not me. Um, she's writing to a, a Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx audience um, primarily, but I know a lot of students who um, are second language learners who've experienced the same thing. I think she's speaking to them really powerfully. She speaks to me really powerfully, even though I'm not part of her primary audience. And so she really challenges me to rethink, you know, like the way I view language. And so um, keep her primary audience in mind. Final questions for me for, from any of you before we wrap up. All right, um, I will be reading the annotations and commenting back so I can join in a, on that conversation. So, all right, I'll talk to y'all later. Thank you. Bye-bye.